Welcome to Tal Capes. I'm Cody Nestor. She's Christina. Hey. And today we're back to talk about DC's latest, Joker, Folly, I Do. And uh, by the end of this, depending on the takes we both have about this film, we may figure out if Christina and I both share the same mental illness. <laughs> uh, Christina, it's been a packed week for me. Lots of videos and things that I've watched this week. So I asked you slash guilted you to kind of step in and take over and do a lot of the heavy lifting for this video. So where would you like to start? Yeah, let's just start with the title. Um, so... Folly à deux. It's French for madness of two. So in other words, we're talking about shared psychosis, where mm -hmm. one person has a delusional belief during maybe a psychotic episode, and a second person ends up adopting or accepting the same delusions, or maybe the delusion is passed to the second person. So our title here tells us that we are literally watching two people share delusional psychosis. And I think that's a pretty good summary of the movie. Um, so let's dive right in. Cody, explain to us this opening scene. It is unique. I have my own thoughts about how it sets the tone, but what significance do you think that opening scene holds here after watching the movie? Well, uh, we're starting off here. You get the, the classic uh, Warner Brothers Looney Tunes theme song. You get a cartoon episode starring starring the Joker called Me and My Shadow. And a lot of this film is kind of centered around, like you said, split personalities, duality, being held responsible for one's own actions. And this kind of serves as a, as a metaphor for that. We see uh, the shadow kind of wrestling away Joker's clothes from him and kind of locking him away in a cabinet. Uh, that kind of leaves the, the uninhibited shadow to kind of run them up, cause chaos until the authorities arrive. And uh, when it's time to switch places with the Joker, when the authorities arrive and kind of leave him to take the fall, the shadow kind of switches back with him. And this kind of sets up, I think, the, the question the film asks later, which is who is responsible for the killing of those six people? Arthur Fleck or kind of a splinter personality kind of born from trauma that kind of manifested itself as the Joker, which is kind of, I think, the heart of what this film is trying to go for. We'll, I think, talk a lot about how it gets there, but I think that's what I kind of took away from, from the opening. What thoughts did you have? Yeah, I think it pretty much aligns. I, I really liked it. I was surprised to see an animated, you know, full Warner Brothers little song and everything. Yeah. But I thought it was actually a cool way to kind of recap the first movie, you know, remind us of what happened since it was for fucking ever ago. Um, and then just kind of reset the stage, the vibe maybe for what we're about to watch. I liked it. I thought it was interesting. Um, yeah, it's um, it's a, it's a it's a big swing right out the gate, and I think that's another thing we'll talk about with this movie is there's a lot of kind of big swings that may or may not work. Yeah, yeah, and speaking of a big swing, uh, that being said, I think the big talking point about this movie is that spoiler alert: it is a musical. Uh, so before I get into my own feelings on the subject, because I have a lot actually. You've seen the movie now. Let's get it out of the way straight out front. Do you feel that all this rage about it secretly being a musical is justified? Um. Well, I mean, to, to kind of start, I don't think that it was any secret that this film was going to be a musical of, of sorts. <laughs> like, if, if you're a film buff, you certainly should know... Um, and if you're just like a casual fan, then I think the trailers for this film should have given you at least, it should have at least set the expectation that this had some musical elements and it wasn't going to be exactly the same kind of film as 2019's Joker. So if there's rage to be felt though, I would hope it's more about the execution of the musical elements in the film or whether or not they should have even, there should have even been musical elements in the film at all. Not the fact that it was a quote unquote secret musical, which <laughs> it wasn't. Um, I think that's kind of been overblown. And, and that's kind of my issue. I think it's I think it's too much of a departure from Joker 2019 for most people. I think it is for me. Joker 2019 isn't it isn't high art and neither is this. Uh, the first film was basically taxi driver with clown makeup. Uh, it was kind of carried by competent filmmaking and the performance of Joaquin Phoenix more than anything else. And 
say what you will about it. People liked it. It made a shit ton of money. And to kind of pivot to a follow-up film into some type of musical of sorts, whether it fits narratively to kind of represent Arthur's fractured and kind of delusional mind, it seems to be a bridge too far for most audiences. And especially to me, when the musical elements of this film suck balls. Um, <laughs> the, the musical moments overall were not memorable and not interesting to me. It's a lot of like creaky voices going, the sun will come out tomorrow, tomorrow. And like, it's a bunch of that. And the only one that I could argue for staying musical number wise would be like the Joker and Harley TV show one. Um, but that's, that's kind of my overall take. What, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, completely opposite. So, um, I (laughs) think, look, I think there are moments where the music really does fit seamlessly into what's going on. Um, the, if my friends could see me now when they're running away from the building in flames, I think that at certain times we're not just seeing, but we're hearing Arthur descend into madness some of the songs are actually cluing us into what Arthur feels when he becomes the Joker, who he wants to be. So there is, he sings a song called The Joker, you know, The Joker Is Me. It's this really flamboyant rendition of the same song from this musical from the 60s. It's called The Roar of the Grease Paint, The Smell of the Crowd, which, fitting, right? Entertainment. I, I think that Arthur used comedy as a child to really mentally escape from his mother and his life. And as an adult, he's almost using music to escape his own psyche as he kind of falls apart. Now, that being said, there are moments I feel that really fucking drag on. Some that can definitely just be a standard dialogue scene. Um, one of the last songs where he's on the phone with Harley, it just lost me. That's, but, that's it. Uh, that's yeah. my problem. That's my problem, too, is like a lot of the musical numbers, quote unquote, dragged the movie to a fucking halt. And they yeah. could have just been scenes. Like, yeah, I don't mind. I like you said, I I, I, I kind of totally forgot about that escape scene. I don't mind those. And like, I get it from a narrative perspective that it lends to what Arthur is thinking and to even know what what he's thinking compared to what he can show even in some scenes. But, like, there's some of those um, that are just – they just drag it to a halt. There's too much of that type of musical number, if you will. There's too many of those type scenes where he's talking to her on a payphone or talking to her machine on the payphone that grind it to a halt for me. That's my big problem. Yeah, I, 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 again, I, I, you know me, I love a musical, but I think a lot, I think there's some of it that could have been cropped out. I mean, I will say overall, I think it's part of the overall vision of the movie. It seems in line with what we've previously seen of Arthur wanting to be an entertainer and escape in this way. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a unique way of showing him mentally crack, you know, for what it is, but yeah, um, moving along now, though, <laughs> let's, let's, we'll agree to disagree, Cody. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, that's, <laughs> I think we're on an agree to disagree, like I said. I, and I mean, I don't, I, I think your opinion is valid, and I think there's a lot, a lot to it, and I think we both are coming at, at it from two different perspectives, and there's some com, there's some commonalities in it, but yeah, I think it's one of those, like, like this movie in general, I think it's going to divide a lot of people. Oh, yeah, it, it definitely is. It definitely is. Um, you know, I, the f- the first person I talked to about this was a random waiter at a restaurant, and he was telling me that he heard a lot of the hate for it, a lot of the hate for the musical, but he really liked it because he thought it was Arthur just going crazier and crazier throughout the movie. Um, mm. And so, yeah, like I said, I think there's a lot that could have been uh, dialed back a little bit, but I'm all right with it. I like it. Um, now, let's move right along. Tell me... What do you think about Lee? Now that we know her real background, how she helps influence, maybe even manipulate Arthur to more fully embrace the Joker, what are you thinking about Lee? Well, Lee, obviously here, played by Lady Gaga. Um, Well, to start off, I did, did, again, I wasn't tricked. I did know this was going to be a musical of sorts. But was I the only one that was kind of crazy for expecting DC's version of A Star is Born with Joker and Harley? (laughs) I thought that's what we were kind of going for. And after kind of watching the film, it's crazy to me that they cast Lady Gaga 
to lean on her acting more than to lean on her ability to sing. I thought it was going to be the opposite. I thought she was going to fit more into the film because she is a talented artist with some acting ability, but they're more leaning on it to her to act and not so much for her singing. And I don't know, that kind of threw me off. But I mean, Lee, I mean, Lee is what she starts off, but her name is Harley. It's Harley Quinn, the, the, the Harley Quinn that we know from the comics. This is not it, obviously nothing about, the these movies have been straight adapted from the comics. It's its own spin. It's its own thing. It's kind of an Elseworlds tale. But she, I kind of, I kind of felt about her. She's kind of a one note character. She's she's a rich girl with some parental issues who wants to fuck a bad boy. <laughs> um, and when the bad boy doesn't want to be the bad boy anymore, she drops him like a hot potato. And I mean, she definitely manipulates Arthur into bracing the Joker. To what end? I really don't know. Um, I don't think the character maybe even knows. I don't think the film maybe even knows. She just does it because, I guess, because she can. But I didn't get from this the kind of relationship that I was expecting to see from Joker and Harley Quinn, at least even in name only. Um, So, I don't know. I'm interested on your take. But for me, it didn't... Again, it didn't deliver on what I thought or even not even the traditional of what I thought the relationship could be. It didn't really deliver that much of a satisfying aspect of it, um, of the characters or their relationship to me overall. Yeah, I mean, it it definitely is not what I expected going in here. Now, I'll say this as we progress, as we learn about, like you said, she's a rich girl, right? Right. I really enjoyed the moments after his attorney tells him what her background really is. And we see this doubt creep into his thoughts. You know, what does she really want from me? Does she really love me? Is she just my mom again? You know, you can see his brain kind of churning there. And to the point, we've always known Harley to very often be this kind of lovesick puppy around Mr. J, right? Mm -hmm. We do see that during our um, 18 seconds of paradise that they have. Mm. Um, Beat my record. Yeah, look, remember when I told you I wouldn't want to fuck the Joker? I think the point's been made for me here right um, so i you know I, I think that just like harley always does she does it in our understanding of harley always as harley always does she is finally going to awaken to the truth of this man behind the makeup right whatever universe whatever multiverse version that is of harley she does eventually see through the joker and she falls out of love. I think this was a unique way to do that. Uh, but I do still think that it's kind of aligned with how we see Harley and Joker's relationship evolve over and over again throughout the DC universe. Um, yeah. Now, I- I'm a fucking girl. So I liked the scene where we see Lee dazzle her way up the stairs in her red satin jacket, the Harlequin pattern corset, the fucking Harley makeup, the long blonde hair, everything. We do get to see her basically basically transform into what we would imagine this universe's Harley would look like. I personally foresee a lot of cosplays of this moment coming up, but I actually really enjoyed that movie of her, you know, really becoming Harley. What did you think of that scene? Yeah. I mean, I think the costume and everything, I mean, I, the, that's another, you know, a big plus that these films have had. It, there's there's competent filmmaking to be had here. Costume design is great. I think it works, like you said, for this version of the character. Um, I just, again, I feel like it was, the character was a little bit wasted and a little bit um, kind of a second thought in a way sometimes. She kind of comes off at points. Like you said, I do... The moments, like you mentioned, with with he with Joker kind of reacting, or with Arthur kind of reacting to the fact that she may have lied to him, and kind of coming to terms with that. There's nothing wrong with the performances in this movie when we're actually in the movie, when we're not in Arthur's fractured psyche, or we're not in a musical number, or we're not in one of those those scenes. That those that's some of the most compelling stuff, and that's the the reason that I do those are the parts of the film that I like. But sometimes she kind of comes across sometimes as like, um, 
like a like more little more than like a little, an obsessed groupie, and then when the admiration <laughs> fades, when the rock star kind of isn't as famous as he was, and he, you know he, as he once was, and you know we've never seen a live action version of you know Harleen Quinzel psychiatrist to the Joker like she was depicted way back in Batman the animated series, you know that falls in love with him, that kind of is taken in by him or by a story or by who he is, and I would have thought it would have been more of an opportunity to explore something like that in a follow-up film to Joker if you're going to introduce that character um, since we've never seen that in live action or at least have that spin on it where you're fleshing her out more for the damaged person she is and not just kind of a Joker groupie um, which is kind of the way it kind of comes off as well. There's not a there's not a codependent relationship or anything. It's very much just she's manipulating him into what she wants him to be, and when he's not anymore, she drops him. And, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I was left wanting more from that character, and I think there could have been more done with her. But as far as the costume, I think it works for this version. And, yes, I uh, expect a new variation in slutty Harley Quinn uh, costumes this Halloween. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I do agree. I feel like there's so much more to Harley they just kind of made her mom the psychiatrist and said, here's a rich girl who's mad at her daddy. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, again, I wish they had done more with her. I still like what she is in this movie. I, I still think it aligns with what we've seen a lot of the evolution of Harley and her relationship with Mr. J. But I agree. I think they could have done a whole lot more with her. And I thought, you know, Lady Gaga involved, like I said, I mean, I kind of meant the whole, like, I kind of was expecting something like A Star is Born in terms of the soundtrack here. I'm like, I thought we were going to get some bangers that uh, that would be <laughs> worth listening to on iTunes or something. There's no song that I would go back and, like, listen to from this film. And I thought that was part of what you wanted from a musical, right? To have some yeah. type of memorable song that you would go back and put on a playlist. There's nothing here that I would add to a playlist. And I'm like, you're wasting Lady Gaga her her ability as an artist and then she's not really given too much as an actress so it's like what's the what's the fucking point really yeah i i will say admittedly lady gaga did release her own album called harlequin and it's a lot mm. of these songs from the movie but it's her doing them in her full on a capability okay. Those are better than the movie renditions. I will go ahead and say that. Gotcha. The ones, you know, I've listened to, of course, again, I'm a music person. I have obviously already listened to the soundtrack. It, I, it, it only works when you're watching the musical. You're watching the movie, in my opinion. So, gotcha. agreed. Agreed. They're not, they're not the bangers we were hoping for. Um, speaking of that soundtrack, I kind of want to pivot to something that I added in here. Um, I believe on the soundtrack or one of the soundtracks, there's a, uh, there's a track that kind of accompanies this scene. I think it's called buy me a drink first, something like that. I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. Fact check me folks. Uh, but I want to talk about a particular scene here, Christina. So at one point during Arthur's trial, he's, uh, he's represented by a lawyer at first. He, he ends up kind of representing himself. Um, and firing his lawyer, which I really loved uh, Joaquin's performance as Joker, also performing as a Southern lawyer. I love that. That was <laughs> one of those moments where, again, he's, he's, he's just inhabiting another character here for, for his purposes. But during his trial, he ends up calling out some of the Arkham guards and embarrassing them, notably one uh, played by Brendan Gleeson, who's uh, one of my favorite actors. He's great in almost everything I've seen him in. And upon his return to Arkham, they end up roughing him up. They take him into the bathroom, and the film heavily implies that the guards sexually assault Arthur there. Thoughts on that scene? Christina. Yeah, you know, this scene was heavy. Uh, I Interestingly, I discovered that people are kind of debating whether Arthur was sexually assaulted here or if he just got his ass beat. Yeah. You know, but to the point, that is the song that's here, right? And yeah. Arthur does say, can you at least buy me a drink first before these guards just strip him down, mm -hmm. they drag him to the showers, I think he was assaulted and it was intentional to break him. You know, yeah. these guards are mad. They're humiliated. And this ends up being the thing that really does break Arthur. You know, it's it's a heavy scene, but this is what makes him realize that the Joker is not him. He is yep. always going to be vulnerable, right? Just like when he was a little yep. boy and you just see him go catatonic and he breaks a little bit more all over again. I think it was... 
yeah, it it was it was quite a scene, but there's a lot of weight that's carried with that of breaking that last part of you are not the Joker, man. You're Arthur Fleck. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's how I kind of read it. It's about power. It's about Arthur learning that he's powerless despite this kind of larger-than-life persona as the Joker. When push comes to shove, when he's in a situation like that, he's powerless. And, like, he sees how that persona even and then kind of leaning into it there's kind of a little friend of his he has uh during the film um Mm -hmm. and that leaning into that persona of the joker ends up helping uh his friend get killed after they end up sexually assaulting arthur so it's like that helplessness and vulnerability and, and and learning that the joker is is just a character. It's just a, a part of me now, but I'm not the Joker. I don't have the power that the world and Gotham thinks that I do. So that's kind of how I read it. And I did see kind of people debating whether or not, I think it's implied enough. I think that's the implication with the buy me a drink. That's what it is on the soundtrack. Yeah. They've stripped him to his, you know, down to his jockeys. I think that's the implication. And like, I, again, a very divisive scene in a very divisive movie. But I mean, I think it's there to illustrate that point of the, his health helplessness so i just wanted to kind of ask you what you thought about that so i'll throw it back to you now yeah i, I always like to bring a little rape into the conversation <laughs> of just a little dusting of just, a down home rape yeah just, just a some little SA. yeah just a it's little not a, bit it's not a conversation until we bring SA into it yeah <laughs> it's it's really not a conversation between us if it's not no <laughs> you know it, it really you know that and then yeah his friend ricky dying right again we just see him just go just dead eye right it's cracking whatever was left of him and so we then end up you know foghorn leghorn performance lawyer aside we end up seeing arthur break down in court eventually and he tells us this was all just a fantasy he says there is no joker it's just me right very very uh, black and white from our big number the joker is me right now there is no joker He admits to all the murders he's committed, including that of his own mother. And then we finally see that humanity crack through. You know, he's mentally broken, but we see that crack through. Our wonderful Harley looks heartbroken, pissed off, disappointed. She and a bevy of other supporters just angrily leave the courtroom. So, Cody, tell us what ends up happening here and what does it mean for the fate of Arthur Fleck? Um, well, I think, you know, the first the first Joker film was more about the Joker kind of becoming a, a symbol for, like, the societally and economically oppressed of Gotham, you know, and kind of a revolution sparking from that. And this film is kind of undoing all that and maybe even in a real life way by the creative people behind this is kind of undoing that joker as a symbol that kind of people maybe even took in real life as well and it's kind of like i said it's about undoing that it's about arthur coming to terms with being what some people want him to be and maybe even what he wants to be versus who he actually is and coming to terms with the pack, the the fact that people are infatuated with the Joker and what he represents, and really don't care about Arthur as a person. And like you said, Arthur at the end of the day uh, admits there is no Joker, just him. He's responsible. He killed those six people, not not the Joker. And um, you know this this leaves and sends Lee out of the courtroom. You know one of his last. One of the last people that he thought cared about him or truly cared about him, you know, there's some, some Joker followers, some you know, kind of agents of chaos we also see take off. But, um, you know, this is the stuff in the film when actors get to actually act and Joaquin actually gets to act and have some scenes, some weighty, meaty scenes. Those are the stuff that works because I mean, his performance is just as good, but I don't feel like you get as much of it here because of all the other stuff you have going on with kind of the musical stuff that doesn't resonate with me as much. Um, and it's a great scene and a great performance here when he just kind of comes in and he's like, you know, I was going to come in here basically and, 
play the character and go on a rant, but this is me. This is this is really Arthur. I did this. And, you know, he's got a joke at the end to the jury. He says, knock, knock, who's there? Arthur Fleck, Arthur Fleck who? And that's kind of where the scene ends. And I think you can kind of assign a lot of meanings to that. I was thinking about it. Does he mean even though he doesn't know who Arthur Fleck really is as a person anymore? Or does he mean, does anyone even know who Arthur Fleck is that or even exists uh, because they just see the Joker? And I think you could kind of look at it in, in a couple of ways there. And I think, for me, if the film was more of, of, of that, more Harley and Joker, more of the symbol of the Joker versus the man behind the Joker, and not this sad, sack, creaky voice singing I probably would really have enjoyed the film a lot more than I did because there are good parts of this film. There's good ideas, and I'm not saying, again, this is not high, high art, even though it tries to sometimes pretend to be, but you have some great actors here and you have some interesting ideas, and a lot of people are pissed off because they see this as like this film shitting on the first film and undoing everything and kind of confirming some of the things that the ending of the Joker 2019 kind of left open ended. I don't, I don't really care about any of that stuff. Like I can always just view that film of working on its own if I wanted to, and just being a one-off and just forgetting about this completely, but there are interesting ideas here that I actually like and wish kind of were explored a little bit or seen a little bit more instead of, pivoting to some of those weird musical numbers that kind of drags it to a to a screeching halt for me yeah i i think that some of the courtroom scenes were some of the best scenes because he's really we are we're still accomplishing seeing him crack in a non-musical way uh but we're seeing him evolve in the first time he talks about you know who all do you see you see the joker who am i i am the joker this is all you see you don't see arthur we flip down to the end and he again says there is no joker it's just me you know like he's really finally coming down to reality so i think some of those courtroom scenes were some of the best ones i think those could have been that vibe could have been the whole movie i I think that would have definitely again and i like i like the musical aspect i'm a musical girl but i'm also a dc girl and i think that we could have definitely cast a bigger net and maybe not uh, alienated so many of the fans by kind of leaning into that. I think it made it more of a Lady Gaga show thing versus what we were expecting. Um, But, uh, you know, I I do want to talk. I I was told by that random waiter that there was a twist ending. There was quite this ending. It wasn't exactly what I was expecting. What what happened, Cody? What do you think of the ending of this movie here? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't... I mean, by this point, when they, when it's time for the ending, it definitely wasn't what I was expecting either. I don't really know what I was expecting out of the film at that point. Um, I figured there was no way Arthur was going to get away with it. But, um, yeah, we kind of get here. Arthur's kind of, you know, his last kind of monologue to the jury was what we just talked about is, you know, but this... This is me. There is no Joker. It's it's Arthur Fleck. Um, at his uh, at the verdict, Arthur is eventually is found guilty. Um, during the reading of the verdict from the jury, uh, someone blows a car bomb outside the courthouse, um, and this um, gives a couple things. So, first off, one of the things that I want to mention that you know this this film series now these two films have brought in some kind of uh, famous. Uh, Batman characters. Again, we had the Waynes in the first film. We had even had a uh, young Bruce Wayne cameo, things like that. This film introduces District Attorney, uh, Attorney Harvey Dent, who is um, prosecuting Arthur and his crimes. Um, we do see kind of a new take on potentially the uh, the Harvey Dent origin story. He is actually, uh, his face is mangled in that bombing. I thought that was a very interesting way to go about that. And I thought that was actually a unique kind of take on that that I would have loved to seen done in like a Matt Reeves-esque Batman film and like Mm -hmm. that would be a good way to change things up from the acid in the face of the comics or the gasoline on the face from the Dark Knight and he get injured in court 
and and kind of using that to become Harvey Dent. Because I thought I saw the scene and the execution and all that and the actual bombing. I thought was mm-hmm. executed, you know, tremendously well. I thought all that was great. Um, I've seen people online asking, you know, who. You know, unanswered Joker questions. Who blew up the courthouse? And I'm like, that's that's really not the point. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think. I think the point is that it, it was blown up. And I'm like, all the outcomes work for whoever does it. I mean, in my mind, if I had to assign someone, it's just agents of chaos that are using the Joker as a symbol to, you know, to kind of, kind of lash out against the government or the courts and all that kind of stuff. But I'm like, all the outcomes there work for the bomber. Arthur, uh, at, you know, he beats the hangman's rope, so to speak, and gets a quick death potentially and becomes the martyr that part of Gotham wants him to be. Or he lives and escapes to go back to maybe being the symbol of anarchy in Gotham. Or he lives and stays in custody in which <laughs> he's responsible um, for his crimes, but still justice has been disrupted and chaos caused and the rule of raw, uh, law disrupted, justice disrupted, all of that stuff. Like, so I don't. It, the point is not who blew it up. It's it's the point of doing it. And like I and like I said, I, I think people are kind of losing sight of that. Uh, Arthur, though, he does live. He does kind of escape. He does leave the courtroom, and he's kind of quickly ushered into uh, a car by some, uh, we'll call them Joker lovers um, here, <laughs> one dressed exactly like the Joker. And uh, there's a there's the kind of that scene and some of that moments of realization as he's just laying in the back of the car as the city kind of descends into chaos, like, you know, kind of listening to these two guys in the, the car kind of talking kind of reverence to him and what are they going to do? What's the plan? You can, you can kind of see him and this kind of freak out moments that he has where he's like, I, I don't want any part of this. So uh, he, uh, he goes, jumps out the car, runs away from them. He goes back to those famous Joker steps from the first film and finds uh, Harley there. And this is where we get, we get our last scene between with Harley and the Joker, Harley and Arthur, I should say, really. And, uh, I mean, at this point, Harley basically just confirms she has no interest in Arthur Fleck. She's she's all about some Joker. She's all about some Mr. J, and she basically <laughs> leaves. They have an okay scene together. My question is, though, she mentioned to him earlier in the film, um, and obviously she's a known liar at this point, but um, she mentions to him earlier in the film that she's pregnant after their 18 seconds of passion. Um, he kind of questions her about that. She really doesn't answer one way or the other. Do you think she was really pregnant? No, that bitch ain't pregnant. That bitch ain't pregnant. <laughs> she was trying yeah. to baby trap. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Like this is your standard baby trap, classic baby no. trap. Yeah, that classic, bitch ain't pregnant. Classic. Yeah, exactly. Classic, uh, classic baby, uh, baby trap there. Um, but yeah, after after kind of Lee kind of takes off and leaves him there, um, he's quickly arrested and taken back to to Arkham. And um, the last scene of the film, he's kind of back in the the kind of rec room watching TV with everybody else. Uh, He's told that he has a visitor on his way down the hall. He's kind of stopped by a young man wanting him to to tell him a joke. And uh, the punchline of that joke ends up being you get what you fucking deserve as that young man uh, proceeds to kind of shiv Arthur in the stomach multiple times. And uh, as Arthur kind of bleeds out and laying on the floor there, the young man can be kind of seen in the background, out of focus, kind of cutting uh, what's referred to as a Glasgow smile across his face, reminiscent of Heath Ledger's Joker, but cutting a smile, cutting his cheekbones, all that good stuff uh, across his face. And uh, that's where film ends with Arthur left bleeding, lying on the floor. Yeah, yeah. Um, You know, and with him, you know, maniacally laughing so now this what is it this infectious laugh is now passed on right um yeah. i i i liked the ending in that i think that it proves something that is try, tries to be proven in a lot of these movies that the joker is really more than just this one person we see this kind of time and time again with the joker in a lot of iterations that you know the crew develops it grows what the Joker stands for, like you said, is it against the government, against the courts, what have you, what the Joker stands for ends up becoming more than one just crazy ass guy in clown makeup, right? I think at the, the, in a deeper way, Arthur has been tormented his whole life. He's been tortured his whole life. It's gotten worse. This last person who he thought would love him for him is a fucking liar and just used him, right? I think this ending ends with Arthur finally at peace. 
and as we're kind of seeing as he gets out of the courthouse, you know, and people, the Joker supporters, I think that his death is going to make him a martyr. It's this movement that he's he's created is now really going to kick off in Gotham. So I actually enjoyed the ending myself. Yeah, I didn't I didn't mind the ending at all. I, I, I mean, I think, you know, in the ways that you could wrap this up, it's probably um, – one of the better ways. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't mind it. I know there's like everybody wants to because we live in uh, the era of uh, the DCU and then the DCEU and the MCU and everything's connected. And like these these films are not meant to be connected. Everybody's like, oh, is this is this the new Joker? No, he's not. He's not the new Joker. He's not. You know, Arthur may have never been the real Joker, whatever, quote unquote. But the, these films live in their own world. It's Elseworlds. Uh, I heard someone talking or an article or something I saw where it's like, is this the Heath Ledger's Joker? No, it's shut up. <laughs> it's not How? Heath Ledger's Joker. <laughs> that makes absolutely no sense. How? The ages are completely off. Like, just shut up. Like, it's just clickbait articles for the sake of clickbait articles. But I'm like, yeah, you could argue this this film ultimately devolves into the same type of um meaning that the Dark Knight trilogy was going for, which is Batman as a symbol. This is Joker as a symbol and what that kind mm -hmm. of represents and means. But I guess from a vastly different perspective on what it means to be a symbol for good versus for evil or for anarchy here. But I mean, yeah, I didn't mind it. I thought given what we had, I thought it was a satisfying enough ending uh, for a film that, um, doesn't quite check the boxes for me through most of it. Another question I had for you is that, you know, the guard kind of informs right. um, Arthur that yeah. he has a visitor I, I, there. So in your mind, you're going like, maybe is it Lee? Is it somebody else? Is it Harvey Dent? Like, we never get to see the visitor. But my question to you, was there even a visitor, do you think? Or were the guards just in on his murder? There is no fucking visitor. They were just <laughs> uh, there. There's there's no fucking visitor. There's no way that the timing works out that way. I, when I watched it, I immediately thought, yeah, they're setting him up. What they did to him wasn't enough. This is it. They've got to get rid yeah. of him once and for all. Yeah, no, there there was no fucking visitor, and it's yeah. and it's sad because again, they're playing on who Arthur is. That Arthur is desperate for this love and Arthur wants to be accepted and they give him one last hope that maybe she's here. Yeah. Nah. Yeah. yeah. And that's used to take his life away. Yeah, I agree. I don't think there was ever a visitor. I think this was a, again, a way to get to take Arthur out of the picture to, to end that story, to prevent anything like this from happening again, which is kind of something I was thinking about today. I was just driving around after watching the movie. And like, I mean, this, this is a movie that kind of sits with you as a longtime DC fan where you're like, I don't know how to feel about this. And I was just thinking, I would love to have seen more of a, a politically driven angle to this film where like, you know, cause in the first film, Joker 2019, uh, the three guys that are killed on the subway, they, they all work for Thomas Wayne. So I'm like, you know, what if there's some big Gotham figure who's kind of trying to, he's maybe Joker is, um, his performance as this Southern Gregory Peck lawyer he is kind of swaying opinions and seeing things kind of going the way that he may get exonerated from this kind of some kind of split personality defense. And maybe there's some, um, big shot Gotham millionaire who lost a son that's kind of pulling the strings. It pays those Arkham guards to like shut him up and silence him. And he comes into court with a broken jaw or something like more, some, some mm -hmm. kind of political angle that could have went to him and feed into him being murdered at the end and things like that. I don't just, just something that I thought could make it more interesting more than what some of the stuff we got, because there's good here. There's, there's really good things. And there's some stuff that I really I question the decision making and I question why the need why the need for such a hard pivot is I guess my, my end of the day thing. Yeah, no, I, I definitely understand that. And I, I agree, like and even with like making it more of the political thing, we could have ramped up more of the Harvey Dent because I personally did quite enjoy uh, the new origin story for Harvey Dennis Two Face here getting damage in the blast. So yeah. I think they really could have pulled more of that into it. Um, and again, that I think it would have lent itself to a little bit more depth here in who the Joker is in terms of Gotham's landscape. But I agree. There is, I think there was some good. I think there was some that threw me off. So with that, it is that time. Let's rate the movie. You start us off. What rating are you giving Joker for the Ado? 
Uh, I've thought about this all day. Um, <laughs> and I'm really, I'm really, I keep second guessing myself. And I think no matter what score I give this, I think a year from now, a day from now, six months from now, I'm going to probably change my opinion for better or for worse. Like I really have had a tough time, probably the toughest time of anything that I that I've watched since doing this show and trying to give a review on, because I do think there, like I said, there is some really good stuff here. There's some great scenes. Joaquin Phoenix just didn't forget how to be an actor since Joker 2019. His performance is what carried that film. He carries a lot of the good things here. I wanted, I just wanted more of that. I wanted less of the creaky, awkward singing scenes that didn't drive the story you know, when I think of musical, I think you sing a big musical number that drives the story, right? You drive forward in it. Some of the musical numbers may have informed the characters and what they're thinking, but it didn't do enough to kind of drive the story forward to me. Lady Gaga, I think, was wasted here. Um, I think if we were just really going to... I think someone who is traditionally looked at more as just an actress could have also carried that role if you weren't really going to rely on her singing in the film if you were just going to shutter her off to the soundtrack release like you could have brought in someone that may have could have added an extra dimension here and maybe kept it from seeming more one note but I think it's really the writing is what sent that character down the river a little bit for me she should have had more to do I think been a bigger part less of a a groupie and a manipulator leave her you know leave her as a manipulator if you want but the kind of groupie aspect of rich kid with daddy issues likes the bad boy is just I know I'm boiling it down to the most simplistic thing but that's really what it is kind of at the end of the day to me there's really a lot of good here but there's really also just as much if not more that I don't care for that grinds it to a halt um I, I was I was never one that was asking for this film I was never like man I want to follow up I thought Joker 2019 fine could have left it there stands on it all its own pretty good solid movie not the best movie I've ever seen made money but good and solid I was never asking for this um for me, I think it lives in that mediocre to subpar world. Um, I can't call this decent because I think, like I said, I think it's such a pivot. Um, maybe I'm too hard. Maybe I'm not hard enough. I'm going to give it a four. I think this is subpar to me based on at least the level that I was going in expecting from what we got in the grimy 1970s taxi driver-esque Joker universe and to pivot to this didn't work for me so I'm gonna say it's a four I'm gonna say it's subpar yeah I, I that's pretty much where I kind of guess you would land uh, I am gonna give it a six I think it was decent you again you've heard the things I like about it you've heard the things I don't like about it honestly I enjoyed it more than I thought I would going in I did not think I was gonna like this again I'm a music person I still just did not think I was gonna like it um, it definitely was not what I would call a good or great movie. Um, again, by now, you know I'm a fan yeah. of music in all its forms. Uh, the musical aspect worked for me in here somehow at certain points. At certain points. Um, and as I do, I did see this twice. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I... I, I, I uh, and I don't... I To say this, if I'm watching it twice it means that there's something about the first watch that I feel didn't stick, right? Right. So that's what I tend to do when I watch things twice. I will say I liked it more the second time. I personally am a big fan of Lady Gaga. I thought that, like you said, Joaquin had these moments where he did really well. I, it still left me wanting in a lot of ways. Agreed. I, I really wish they would have developed Harley more. I think that there are different versions of her where she's developed out beyond the Joker. And I really love that about Harley. Um, you know, bring Poison Ivy in. Let's see some scissoring. Let's go. Yeah. But I, now you know, you're talking. <laughs> that's a real movie. We're bringing it up to a masterpiece. That's, a, that's two points right there. Easy, I'd add Yes. To. But unfortunately, no no um, villain titty bumping. So I'm going to hmm. give it a six. I'm going to say it was decent. I liked it better on the second watch. Six it is. 
Yeah, uh, and, and to your point about you've watched it twice, I, I, I watched the courtroom scene with Arthur's confession um, again. That was the only scene that I rewatched after the initial watch. To to for me, it's not a film I'd want to go back and watch again. That's kind of where it left me. I was <laughs> like, I'm good. I've seen it once. Um, maybe I didn't understand it or get it. Maybe more would have been shown to me on a second viewing. But after my first viewing, I was left saying – you know what? I'm good. Don't need to go back here again. I've I've seen it. I'll check it off the list, and it'll live there forever. And I'll probably just kind of look at it like I look at a lot of franchises these days. I'll just enjoy Joker 2019 for what it is, and just leave that one on the shelf. Yeah, yeah. I definitely will say I'll enjoy this in its own little world. It's its own movie. It's separate from the first one. It's not connecting <laughs> to the other movies. It's not part of it. Let me just enjoy it for what it was. What a fun, random DC musical. It was fine. Yeah. Did I lose you, Christina? I'm still here. Oh, sorry. Thought I lost you there for a <laughs> second. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm still here. Technical difficulties, folks. Yeah, I think, I think that pretty much sums it up here. Anything yeah. more that you want to add about... Joker, Folly, I do before we get out of here. Nah, I'm. Uh, that was that. That was it. That'll be the last time I see it. It was fine. Gotcha. <laughs> Next week, titty bumping. Titty, titty bumping, bumping and, and scissoring. scissoring. Yes. Next yes. movie we'll watch will include titty bumping and scissoring. Okay. I'll make sure to work that in. Yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that's it for this episode, folks. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe. Feel free to send us an email. Get in touch with us on social media. Christina, thank you for joining me again uh, here on Tau Capes. <laughs> Tau Capes will return. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time. Bye, guys. Bye.